All right, uh, I'm going to show you how basically how I work with templates and the creative process I go through. So we're going to go track by track through my template in Ableton. And typically this is how I start the album process and I work my way through the drafts. I'll try to do like three or four uh, drafts a day and um, just try to work as quickly as possible. It's kind of like my way of speed writing. So we're gonna go through and kind of check out all the components and some of the arrangement as well. So starting here uh, at the top, I actually have a sine wave at 440 just so you can hear, uh, so you can tune things like analog keyboards, things like that, just as a reference tone. So nothing really sexy about that, but uh, it's useful to have in there, surprisingly. And it's just good if you want to test your system, you can drop it down, test your lows. It's sort of a useful utility in there. So that's the first track. Uh, actually, first one before that is Timeline. So everything's split into eight bar chunks. Um, I have a basic arrangement here with intro, 16 bars, first breakdown, chorus, first verse, pre-chorus, chorus two, build, drop, uh, and so on. And uh, I've used this method for about 10 years of just having everything marked in there. So even like the last musical note and the final outro, the final end. So even when it's ended, I want that last note and then uh, to really mark where that end of the reverb tail is there. So I don't cut anything off. So that's super important. So that helps me just sort of have a, a framework for building the song. And so I have my A and B section and C section, all that stuff is in there. So in this particular template, I think it's important to keep updating your template. I try to make changes to it every few weeks. Uh, it's, it's always a work in progress. There's no perfect template. And it's good to have different templates for different things. I might have one for remixes, one for vocal tracking, one for mixing. But uh, in this case, I will typically use this template uh, all the way to the end to even mastering. So I've got out, the first track here is the top kick. And um, so I've got one layer of top kick, which is bassism, which I love. And I just have a short kick and I use that for um, just that punctual sort of top end to the kick. And maybe I'll have one other layer as the tonal uh, base of the kick, the, the sub kick. So let's listen to just that. Super basic uh, and you know, maybe I'll tune the top, probably not. Maybe I'll just kind of keep it on the high end because you're gonna hear that lower tonal stuff more in the lower registers. So uh, it'll be something simple like that. Maybe I'll filter it out and just really push that top click to it. Um, and typically my ghost kick for triggers uh, is something small like that, like a small bassism kick. Um, I have another layer, like I was saying, for longer kicks to make sure it's in tune with the track. If it's a really long decaying kick, I'll use bassism for that more sustained kick. And we'll listen to that. So maybe it's something that's longer. That's a pretty low one. But if I bring up the frequencies, and it depends what key I'm in, you know? So if I want to tune it, I love it because you can just drag and drop to something else. Let's go even higher. I would never have a kick that high, but you get the idea. You can hear more of the tone in there. But super useful plugin. You can really kind of manipulate all the parameters in there. It's easy to get lost in that. Um, so I will layer a top kick, a, a low kick, and oftentimes a sample to kind of fill out, um, add a little bit of noise, a little bit of grit, a little bit of that medium part of the kick. So I've got a few different samples in this template that I use. Let's pull that one up. I think it's like a vengeance kick. So I, I'll put those in a drum rack maybe and, um, it's pretty useful to have, just to have them you know, on hand. You can just fire them, swap them out at any point. And that's sort of the beauty of the ghost kick is obviously you can swap out your samples and your sidechain's not gonna get affected the same way.
I'll either use, uh, for sidechaining, I'll either use the stock compressor in Ableton and sidechain that to a ghost kick, or I'll use a, a dynamic sidechain uh, shaping plugin like LFO Tool or Cable Guy's Volume Shaper or the Nicky Romero uh, sidechain plugin. They're both really useful. I have the Nicky Romero kick plugin on here, which is really good. It's just got such good uh, default presets that I've been using that for a lot of my stuff recently. It's a very Nicky Romero kind of kick. Uh, so that's super useful. You can tune it uh, and you can take those last two anchor points and change the key. So really useful, very straightforward. Uh, it's really cool when an artist like Nicky will come forward and kind of take some of his tricks of the trade and sound and really make a useful plugin out of it. So it's great to see stuff like Steve Duda's plugins, like LFO Tool and Nicky Romero's plugins as well. So moving along through the template, um, I have another track in here, which I call kind of the fill groove, which if you listen to stuff like Hard Rock Sofa, I love the way they've just got this sort of rolling groove in the background. And I think, I don't know how they do theirs, but I like to just sort of edit different velocity strengths and maybe use a step sequencer. Uh, maybe I'll do it with toms. It's something that's propelling the groove forward. It's kind of the engine room of the track. And, you know, it sounds kind of plain like that, but maybe, you know, you throw a treatment on it. put a, a bit crusher or something on there. Um, you can mangle it any kind of way you want, but let's, let's throw something else on there. Just something, it's an element to just sort of push the track forward and provide a little bit of groove. It doesn't have to be a huge element of the mix. Uh, so after that fill groove, uh, typically have some stacked snares. So I already have these regions set up with a few different things stacked, and I can move those around using the drum racks in Ableton. So if we take off the kick, it's just a couple different layered snares. Um, and I can kind of go through and, you know, layer them any way I want. And I love that in Ableton, so the way it's so simple, you can just stack them really quick and audition them. So it's a clap, clap and a snare. Maybe we'll add a little something else on there. That's a weird sound. Let me take that out. It's very easy to just sort of flip through those really quickly. So, you know, I'll have um, those regions set up so that there's they're on the one and sometimes just on the two. Uh, so same thing with the clap. If I, on this other clap layer, I like to have them, a lot of my tracks, sometimes it'll be on the one, sometimes on the two. So, so some it's like that, and then some it's right on the kick. So I like to have that already done and ready to roll. Uh, sometimes I'll have envelope set up ahead of time that I can use to, that I really like for automation to save time. If I know I'm going to have these really dynamic sweeps, maybe I'll have those already in as set regions. You know, it's useful to have sort of a palette of envelopes. And then uh, I like to put in hi-hats at this stage to kind of move things along. And every track has a EQ on it with a high pass and a low pass. So I can quickly dial in what I want. and quickly sidechain it. So let's see what we have here. We've got the kick. Got the kick hi-hat, got some fill grooves. I 
don't like to fill up the percussion too much early on a track. I want to keep it open. Depends where it's going. If it's if it's more of a track that's just a dance floor kind of banger, um, which is typically not what I do. I typically want to develop the song first and then build everything around that, and then maybe remix it later. Makes you know present it in a different, harder context later on for a festival mix or a club mix. Um, so moving along past that. I have two layers of triggers that I use. One for gates to trigger a gate. So if I want a gate, uh, like take a sustain pad and make it just go t -t 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 like that, I can have this trigger ready to go. It's already going to be triggering eighth notes. And I'm using a hi hat as the trigger on that. So that's really useful. And after that, there is the snare trigger, which I don't even know what that means, but let's see. <laughs> Snare trigger might be for um, you know triggering reverb to sort of take a little while to open up or delaying sound. I like to make sure that the sounds all have their room to breathe and they're not all firing at the same time. So one thing I really love in Ableton is that I can nudge things around, like I have the clap five milliseconds ahead. Um, and I have, what else? I kind of keep the mid-range stuff right on the grid. The, the highs are being pushed forward and the bass is being delayed. And your ear just seems to gravitate towards that. It just likes that for some reason. The biggest reason is that they're not all firing at once and that your brain loves to look for this sort of upper noise uh, harmonic trigger when a, when a sound starts. So it's just, I think it's evolution. Um, and moving along down here, we're still on drums. Everything's color coded, as you can see. I'm working with groups in uh, Ableton. And I'll, maybe I'll throw some loops in. There's nothing in there right now, but let's check out my library. Um, I think it's really important to go through your library and sort of goodwill it, is what I call it. Uh, it's like going through your clothes and saying, shit, I never wear this. I'm going to throw it out or donate it. And like, take your bad samples that you always scroll through, get rid of them. You don't have to delete them, just put them in a folder far away, bury them, put them somewhere else. Uh, there's just not enough time to deal with all the different sample libraries that are out there. And if you keep scrolling through the same crap, uh, it's not as productive. So really personalize your sample collection, find your favorite things. And I think it's really important to go through and take stuff from different libraries and not just, you know, vengeance number three. Um, go through and like use like some of these drum loops from Proc and Fitch that do deeper stuff or Tech House. Take some hip hop samples from a hip hop pack uh, and mix that with different vengeance packs and so that people can't quite place where your samples are from. So there's really interesting loops. Uh, I like some of this Proc and Fitch stuff even though it's a different style than I do. It's more swingy. But they've got these great, you know, shakers and percussions. So maybe I'll put a loop in like that in a track. And maybe I'll side chain it, maybe I won't, but let's see. So that is providing the movement. Um, I really like to do chords and things like that before I get too far into percussion and shakers and things like that. So often I'll come back after I have the chords and I'll put the shakers and additional percussion and additional rides and movement and things like that later on. But we're just going section by section here with the template. So after the loops, um, I'll, you know, with drums, I'll put rides in there. Again, using drum racks in Ableton. Uh, and these are stacked and panned, and I like to get with in the most organic way possible. I like to naturally take two different sound examples, hard pan them, rather than using a widener. I mean, wideners are great too for, you know, um, broadening the high frequencies and narrowing the lows, especially, or maybe mid-side EQing things. But if you can get it right with the samples and just choose the right sounds first, you're going to save a lot of plugins and a lot of hassle later on, and your computer is going to run faster. So with this. Each of these within the drum rack are panned. Um, let's see. Actually, these aren't hard panned. But I'm going to pan them now. And just sort of fill them out a little bit in the frequency spectrum or in the uh, stereo spectrum. So maybe one will live in the center and both will live on the sides. So that's just the rides. We got the hot percussion going, that loop. Let's 
get that fill groove. Okay, so there's some really basic drums going there. Nothing incredible, but just something really basic to demonstrate. And after that, I have uh, a section for my synths. So I have these three synths, uh, the Voyager, I have the Buchla Easel, and I have the Dave Smith Prophet 08. Um, typically, I will start with the digital synths first because they're always in time, but sometimes I like to reach for the analog stuff first and just get a different result. So, um, you know, I'll trigger stuff on these keyboards and just see what happens. So you never know. And I'll, I have stuff midi through here. So let's turn on some of these guys. So sometimes I'll have uh, preset patterns in there. Like if I want to do something with the arpeggio loop, I might have one legato note to trigger that already in there. Just trying to save time. So let's put something like that. We'll just do one note in here. And we'll trigger that for the profit. Turn on an arpeggiator. Let's turn on delay compensation. Actually, let's take off delay compensation so we can hear that a little tighter. So I love using stuff like software to extend the use of the hardware, and that's what's really cool with plugins, real-time MIDI plugins like the arpeggiator and the pitch shifting and uh, chord creation. They're really useful. You can get totally different ideas you wouldn't be expecting by doing kind of a more of a shuffle groove or changing the note division, so it's super useful. Um, but if I'm just doing really basic sort of songwriting and building a musical bed, I'm going to just start with some basic chords, and I'll usually pull up a soft synth for that and then layer that with analog synths later on. So I might use uh, Silent, I really like Anna. Um, Omnisphere, I like a lot for more of the complex sounds. And Trillion, I really love for the guitars in there and the bass, and the, the synth bass in there is just incredible. And I absolutely love all this Arturia stuff. Um, I just got into it, I don't know, I've been sleeping on it. The Jupiter, incredible, and the Oberheim are really, really good. So Jupiter is super useful. Kind of a bizarre interface with all these other things going on here, but very, very tiny. You almost need glasses to look at the interface, but great presets, great sounds. So super useful for just coming up with chord progressions on the fly. Uh, so I've got Jupiter in there. I've got some Nexus layers, which I love. I love their expansion packs. I love uh, using their pianos to kind of build drafts. So typically I'll just start like that, you know? Just banging away at progressions till something sticks. And then when I do that layer of the chord, maybe I'll do some leads on top of it. So it'll be like. You know, something like that, just to kind of get a real basic skeleton of the song going. Um, so I like to kind of use synths that don't use a lot of processing. So I think that's what you know really appeals with Silent. It sounds really good, and Nexus is pretty good. I mean, it's it doesn't take up tons, but um, it's actually sounding better and better now for some reason. I think they're changing the reverbs and the effects and some of the impulses in there. So there's a lot of amazing software competing for your attention, and you really got to find your favorites in there. 
So there is, uh, Silent has a great pack that um, producer Chris Reese uses, incredible Swiss stuff, and he did it for Silent. And I love the stuff he's made. Super punchy presets, but There's some great like chord stabs and so cool stuff in there. Uh, moving along, yeah, I got some other layers. So I have uh, the analog synths there. So outboard stuff is grouped, and I'll often put a side chain on the live input from the synth, so I can just sort of hear what they sound like in context, pumping to the kick. Um, so there'll be a little bit of delay. You know, you have to compensate for some delay of going in and out of the converters. Um, so I have all my chord stacks in there. On these buses, it's, there's the gates, there's filters, there's basic compressors just to kind of even out the dynamic range a little bit, and a saturator is pretty much on the end of every chain just to make sure no clipping happens and to, let me kind of push sounds a little bit. Moving along, uh, there's my arpeggio layer, which I, I like Silent for doing arpeggios. Um, and then my leads group, so Nexus is in there and Anna. So maybe my most like detuned sounds will be in there. And then Anna has a, it's kind of a digital sound, but I love it. It's just really good presets. Um, there's some really warm stuff in here too, but not a ton of presets come with it, but when I want good plucky sounds, maybe I'll go in here and... So basic sounds, but they just seem to work really well. It's kind of like a mix between um, massive and silent, sort of a hybrid of it. And moving along now, we're getting to the bass layers. Now, bass, I think, is one of the hardest things to manage, and I'm trying to do tracks with, with more bass to them and more impact. I'm using more of the whole sonic spectrum. So I love Massive. Uh, it's definitely been overdone. But it just cuts through in the mix really well, and I love the uh, stereo enhancer they have in there. And I think Steve Duda made a plug-in of it. The, uh, where is it? It's actually just delay on this. The dimension expander is just amazing, and it, it just translates to mono really well. So it's sort of a standard massive preset sound, but it's, it just works well. Uh, again, I got my standard uh, rack of. Uh, high pass filter, low pass compressor, uh, another compressor for side chaining and a saturator. And a cool trick I really like to do is if I'm not really hearing the way the, the low end is side chaining, I'll either transpose it or distort it so I can hear those harmonics and really hear it pump. Because otherwise some of that low stuff, it's hard to judge the timing on. So it's kind of a cool trick. It's sort of like tuning a guitar and tuning it at a, with bass guitar tuning up to higher octaves or harmonics. So I have uh, one layer is Massive. Uh, another synth I've included in there is Anna for some another sort of digital bass sound. I have Operator for just a smooth, simple sine wave. And I'll try to fill out all the octaves, maybe using two bass octaves typically, and really see how I can you know, make them as prominent as possible, not peek out too much in the mix. Uh, I use Trillion for bass a lot. Trillion is just super useful. It's a little heavy on the system sometimes. So we'll check that out. Great guitar presets. It almost sounds as good as the Moog. So Trillion is definitely worth getting. And I'll put maybe even a layer just for the bass drops. I'm trying to do less of these these days where it just sort of goes, you know, sine wave drops. 
Uh, and after that, typically I don't do a lot of vocals in Ableton. I'll record them in Pro Tools. But uh, just if I want to sing a quick guide demo or you know, a quick lead, something I'm hearing in my head, I like to sing on track sometimes and just get out an idea. Uh, so I'll have a layer for the vocal lead, the background, some ad-libs, some vocal chops. This is more structured for a remix where I'll have just a couple different vocal stems to work with. Um, and so my chain is typically, um, typically I'll have SSL, Channel Strip, or the Maserati on there. Right now these are pretty lean just to keep the session low. But most of the vocal working and the comping and the layering and all that is done in Pro Tools. And then I'll bring that stem into Ableton. Um, and after that, we're getting close to the end here, uh, there is my noise and effects area where I already have white noise pre-programmed and pitch rises pre-programmed because they're in every track. I tried to do tracks without them, it just doesn't work. So uh, I have white noise from operator triggering and I have it already in sections where I want. I have longer segments and shorter segments where it's going, it's rising up like whoosh, and decaying. And everything's on there, the side chain, got the filters, things like that. I do actually think it is better to render down, to, to layer that with like some vengeance effects hits or some pre-processed white noise. It can be a little too pure sometimes, so maybe you want to layer it a little bit. So sometimes I, I will bring in those impacts and other white layer noises. So that's what these other ones are for. Symbol effects and hits. Pitch rise is just silent. And I'll just, those will be pre-automated, typically, just uh, using MIDI, just to make sure I get those that similar kind of rising effect. And in the effects, I have uh, a short reverb. So I really like the Rob Papen stuff. Really, really like the Rob Papen reverb. Uh, and I like the Manny Marroquin reverb as well. That whole pack is worth getting. It's really, really nice. I know sometimes the Wave stuff can be overwhelming because there's so many different plugins, but there's so many good ones. So you just got to pick a few. Um, I recently, recently did a bundle with Wave, so I picked out my favorite plugins from all of them, and I forgot to put this one in there. So this is one of the secret ones you got to get. Um, uh, I included TrueVerb in the bundle, and Waves NLS, Sound Shifter, HEQ, H Delay, the L3 Limiter and a couple other ones in there. So definitely check that out if you get a chance. And it's really cool to work with a company like Waves. It's obviously an honor because they do such great stuff. And so that's the short reverb. Um, moving along, long reverb, I have the Rob Papen verb as well. Every effect is followed by filters, by the EQ. So, so I can shape that and get rid of the low end stuff. And maybe I want to side chain it. Usually I don't, but just, doesn't seem to work usually for me, but some guys like that sound if they really want a, a tougher, like, you know, sidechain sound. I really like, uh, you know, I really want to try the uh, Nick Romero one or Volume Shaper on there or LFO tool just to do that on effects instead of the stock one. I think those are better at getting more control for your sidechain and less of that sort of middle sidechain, the, the whole, the same old sound that you hear with bass lines and stuff. So those are my effects. And then on the master, um, there's so many good plugins to put on the master, but I love the Sony Oxford stuff. So I have uh, typically, I'll roll off everything under 20. Maybe I'll go as crazy as bringing it up to 25 hertz. And that's just to get a little more bandwidth, a little more loudness out of the mix. After the EQ, I have uh, Brainworks doing a little bit of widening and narrowing. It's narrowing frequencies below around 160 hertz and doing a little bit of widening, typically like on the highs, sort of MS. Um, widening, mid-side. And then I have one of the components of ozone. Instead of pulling up the whole ozone, you can take different components and use them. So you don't have to drain your computer with that. It's a very a processor intensive plugin, especially ozone five. So I will push out the highs and gradually as I get to the lows, maybe I'll narrow the lows a little more, but I'm already narrowing them with Brainworks. So Ozone was originally what I used on all my masters before. It sounded great, but recently I've gotten turned on to Oxford Limiter and Invisible Limiter. So a lot of guys are using Invisible Limiter now. It's pretty amazing how you can push it. Uh, you can get a track really loud while keeping your breakdowns quiet. I have no idea how it does it, but I just crank the input and, and just get it loud. I don't really do that much to it. 
Uh, I love the Sony Oxford one because it does something to the bass. There's some harmonic enhancement. So when you pull up that enhanced curve slider, it just adds a little bit of something to it. And maybe I'll bring the attack down a little bit. Let's get rid of that pitch sound. Maybe to let the kick click a little more, have a little more attack, I might pull that down. But you can drive it pretty hard. Maybe till like, maybe till four dB of gain reduction at the most. Maybe more, it depends what the track calls for. Totally depends. And I have an analyzer, which I don't use it that much, but it's just good to see the overall curve of your mix. And I feel like your, your ear likes to, here's something that has a natural slope to it and there aren't these big peaks sticking out. It's good to see what's um, phasing out and typically I'm just going to hit the mono switch and listen to what disappears. You're always going to have a little bit of collapsing going on and you have to just figure out what are the priority elements, what needs to stand out and be strong in a mono mix. So your, your vocal and your lead and your kick and your bass line that need to be dead center. Um, but it's always like what can be compromised and I think it's really interesting what you can widen and not lose and there's certain things you can get really wide and they still sound perfect in mono and it's just crazy i don't know what it is but there's just that certain sonic harmonic signature to sounds that uh, will not fall apart and uh, so you got to be kind of judicious and be careful what things you widen and what things you keep centered and you know what makes sense to pan and uh, fill out the track and make it louder and what's uh, a compromise so it's always something i'm debating with the track and that's pretty much my main template for doing drafts.